As we said the years before, uh, the force merged to main. Um, Andy is commonly known in our scene. His current talk, CAA versus WikiLeaks, uh, intimidation, surveillance, and other tactics observed and experienced. In his talk, Andy um, aims and to report and shows a collection of his observations, physical, um, visual, and other evidences of the last year incidents that strongly indicate a context of US Central Agency, uh, Central Intelligence Agency, and potentially other entities of the US government acting against WikiLeaks and surrounding persons and organizations. Please welcome, with a very warm digital applause, Andy. Okay, hi. I have no idea how a digital applause works here, but um, uh, thanks for <laughs> thanks for it anyhow. Um, at the beginning, I want to make, and I have to make a few disclaimers so that you know um, which perspective you're getting here. Um, I'm working as a data journalist for quite a while around the topics of surveillance, signal intelligence, data security, and running this funny bug planet. Even started that bugplanet.info before Snowden came with all his documents, but I did work a while uh, with his documents. Um, however, this talk is a bit different, as I'm not talking about things that I, you know, learned, studied, or whatever, but I experienced myself. I'm describing events here where I was targeted, and so I might not be the most neutral person uh, in this scenario, but I'm trying to be technically as accurate as possible anyhow. So forgive me if I'm a bit grumpy about these people. Um, that's just because of the perspective. Um, secondly, um, well, I've also, and the CCC, of course, has been addressing human rights issues in the digital age for a long time. We, and I personally co-founded EG, the European Digital Rights Initiative, um, to ensure the enforcement of human rights in the digital environment. However, what happened here is a slightly beyond digital rights. Uh, it goes into real life. And while I'm a German citizen and I know roughly what kind of laws have been violated here in respect to the German environment, I absolutely would welcome people who uh, help me analyze and understand it from the perspective of the universal human rights um, because there is similar cases with people living in other jurisdictions and so on. Um, second slide of disclaimer, sorry that did so much. Um, so I'm addressing with this talk activities against people surrounding and have been and or surrounding Julian and or WikiLeaks and or other members of WikiLeaks. Um, whatever I describe here is have, have or I have personally observed and experienced it. So it is for sure very incomplete. It's at best a fragment of what's gone on. But um, you will, uh, in case you haven't heard about it yet, that Pompeo um, uh, yeah, made some very clear statements when he was head of CIA. It's pretty clear um, where to attribute these things. Um, and lastly, um, there is, of course, other prisons as mentioned, but I'm keeping them out here for all kinds of reasons. Um, but there will be the time when we will hear more reports and other perspective of this particular situation. So um, here's my little overview. I want to get you an idea how to get into such a mess, um, just in case you know you want it. Um, the context and the timeline, a bit of psychology as it's important because at some point you not only get paranoid, you have this drive to, oh no, this can't be true, right? You have this cognitive dissonance uh, drive inside of you that you would like to stay um, sane. Um, the new normal of IT incidents, we're all used to that, covered versus overt. What, what I mean with the term intimidation surveillance, physical events and their impact, about the elephant in the room, the problem of the missing socks. Um, and at, at the end, a little bit of questions, am I infectious? Um, how to get out of this mess maybe also. So um, how to get into such a beautiful mess? Uh, wait, it's not beautiful. 
Um, well, there are some ideas we share in the hacker community usually, and even um, it's not far from where to get into the journalist community. Information should be free. Free flow of information um, is a bit of a requirement for world peace. And um, we had this, um, and I personally also had this type of self-conception, self-understanding consciousness 20 years already when WikiLeaks started around 2006. So this is not that I was jumping or anybody in the scene was jumping um, onto something that didn't exist until then. But um, WikiLeaks turned out to be an extremely good um, concept as a democracy test. If governments cannot deal with full transparency, well, that tells you a lot about them. And But of course, that is similar to, um, jumping it to the last point, similar to um, working in journalism. When you expose things in journalism, be it corruption, be it hypocrisy of politicians, be it blunt lies or whatever, it's not always about making friends. Um, it's, um, yes, partly making friends and partly uh, pissing people off. That um, happens. However, in this particular environment that Julian inspired to um, create, um, there's some yeah, cultural even misunderstandings. For example, the word conspiracy. For us in Europe, I think many of us in the German hacker scene are inspired by Robert and Wilson's way of saying, oh, a conspiracy is like the world is full of them and we should um, join the best of them. Um, but the in the American context, uh, the word conspiracy is a legal term, unfortunately. And when you are with American citizens in a room and talk about conspiracies, they often get very nervous. And it's kind of a complete different attitude because it's like the U.S. term to define people who belong to a group like a organized criminals or organized, you know, this T word, this other type of entities. And of course, that's absolutely not what we want to get into involved to. But sometimes we mistakenly or misunderstandingly joke about conspiracies and people listening to this get it completely wrong. And I fear that is also what happened. Um, and how, uh, yeah, me and others got into such a mess. Um, so at the end, of course, um, journalism, and that's similar to, um, yeah, dealing with data from a hacker's perspective is about, yeah, supporting media with data and information and so on. Um, <clears throat> so here's a bit of a timeline to give you a time frame. Uh, I'm now, after I was a bit long for about two decades in CCC spokesperson and board member and blah, blah, blah. I moved to the board of the Valhalla Foundation. Valhalla Foundation collects actually money for WikiLeaks under the aspect of WOW's idea of um, yeah, supporting freedom of information since 2010 or so. I joined there a little later. However, when WikiLeaks started to publish the Afghanistan, the Iraq warlocks, the diplomatic cables, um, that already triggered legal investigations and, of course, the arrest of Dan Still Bradley, now Josiah Manning, um, later. So there was always, it was always clear, more or less, right from the beginning, that there's legal trouble on the way, that there's a secret grand jury, and that the Americans didn't really appreciate their war crimes to be exposed and their diplomatic cables to be in the internet to be understood and readable for all of us and the media worldwide and so on. Um, of course, um, when people come together and gather in any project, you have human beings, you have, they have characters, they have mistakes, um, they do things that are not always great. So um, I'm not trying to say here that everything was always great and it was only the CIA messing it up. No, humans make mistakes. And these mistakes in such an environment, of course, get exploited, get amplified, and so on. <clears throat> in 2007, um, Wikileaks started publishing some CIA documents and a whole series of it, the so-called Fold 7 documents. And those documents describe yeah, technology, exploit programs from the CIA. You probably, most of you will know them. If not, you can all look them up. Um, 
these included tools that allow the CIA to pretend to be someone else, including coming from another country, speaking another language, be it from Russia, in Russian, be it from Iran and Farsi and so on. And um, Pompeo, who was at that moment still head of the CIA, got very upset. Uh, there's two references from this. One is from April to 17, and another is from uh, February to 18. In his first public speech as a CIA director in uh, 13 of April 2017, um, he made a, a speech at a conference Waskin in Washington, and he said things like WikiLeaks walks like a hostile intelligence service and talks like an intelligence service. Uh, and called WikiLeaks a non-state hostile intelligence service. So for those of you who know a little bit about information science, there's this idea of data is actually something you can technically measure. Information is data in a context and intelligence is information processed to a level where you can make decisions based on it. So being a public intelligence service, I would say, from that perspective, it's like a honorable term. However, um, yeah, the way Pompeo emphasized it, I think, uh, was slightly not that honorable. He was more comparing it to, you know, other state actors and evil forces and so on, because the U.S. understanding of intelligence services far away <clears throat> from entities, sorry, I need a water. <sighs> Um, is far away from entities just collecting information, but as you know, they also mess up with other people's life and so on. Um, however, a year later, in uh, February to 18, he even upgraded this type of statements. Uh, the Zeit, a German newspaper, reported about what he said at the Munich Security Conference Intelligence Roundtable. And he said really nasty sentence like that he's most of his time he's dealing with the non-state actors and that's like Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, uh, Wikileaks or Hezbollah. Like what a list. So I have no idea. Um, what he has, um, yeah, what turned him into um, comparing these kind of things. I mean, his baller, I could say, we in Berlin, um, we know that they provide actually um, Jami Halumi and, and um, some things, but yes, they are money launderers and are suspected terrorists in some areas or whatever, or have been declared terrorist. But their humus is really good, I can say. Um, however, the... Um, point I'm trying to come to, so Pompeo got very upset. He made all this comparison and he seems to have um, yeah, allocated resources to deal with WikiLeaks and everybody jumping around. And it's no surprise that as the Holland Foundation um, finances selected uh, activities of specific publications there. Um, that we also got in the focus with, with us uh, collecting donations and um, you know talking with the guys and financing some projects. So um, before I'm coming to very concrete events, I want to yeah, get one second into psychology. So of course, when things happen to you, um, from the intelligence perspective, they always come with what's called plausible deniability. When there's a guy standing in front of the door watching, you know, if you come in and out, it's not just someone watching your door, it's someone reading the newspaper or uh, repairing some electrical pipes or some water pipe or whatever. I mean, there's always a good reason for him to be there that has nothing to do with what he's doing. And um, that that's a basic principle, plausible deniability, how intelligence agencies act in the so-called field, so meaning in your home or on the street, they're following you or whatever. <clears throat> so um, over time, um, of course, if you have too much of this, you're seeing these patterns, and that's probably mainly called paranoia. So you get like, you know, suspicious of everything that happens that might be very legitimate, but you get like the feeling that something is wrong and so on. Um, and that can be, um, we could also, instead of paranoia, call it situational awareness at some points, because if it really happens, it has nothing to do with your mind getting crazy. It's just an accurate observation of patterns that happens around of you. But 
you might know that, and your two friends who experience the same might know that your girlfriend your partner um the normal people you deal with they might all not understand this and think that you're driving nuts and this driving nuts is of course an element um that you always have to be self-critical because on the one hand side you might indeed see too much things happening that do not really happen and on the other hand side there's also this human drive that we don't want this CIA guys to be in our life. We want everything is to be fine. And to some extent, maybe that's even healthy to not see the monsters all the time. Uh, but if they are really there and you start denying them while they sit in front of you, mm, that's also not so helpful. So I found myself in this kind of um, yeah, weird environment where all these kind of thoughts come up all the time. <laughs> and I'm starting with the most harmless stuff. So internet attacks, I will, or internet incidents, I would, IT incidents, I call it here. Um, due to the pure volume of it, I will put this into separate um, presentation one day or report and in the next days or weeks or months, and, and you can all have fun with it. But here's just some basic patterns. So devices um, you use as communication terminals or communication devices, they always have issues when you start to do encrypted stuff. And it's always when you do it with specific people. So that's hmm. then mobile phones with data service. At some point, all of them have start to have issues. Very high volume of used data. Um, apps mm, disappear if you use them at all. I stopped using them at all. Um, now, high battery usage when you did nothing with your phone over hours and you were wondering what's going on. Okay, yes, we have Faraday bags. We put them somewhere else. But still, it's a little weird when your battery is empty half day. Um, on LTE, um, when I configured my phone to be on LTE only, it worked mainly fine next to that I couldn't make normal phone calls. But when I had it in the normal mode, it got downgraded to 3G, and there my encrypted connection started to have problems. On my fixed lines, my VPNs, when I try to build up a VPN, shows me certificate errors and problems. Hmm. And then, of course, you deal with journalists, which I'm doing with my colleagues all the time, and they are not technical experts. They all have their Macs and so on. So they have funny issues with their PGP keys not working anymore, with their PGP setups not working anymore. Yes, it's also because it's open source software, but um, there's also something going on. But this is kind of the world we all know and we get used to it. You know, this is like, okay, IT doesn't work. Secure um, connections break. Well, happens all the time. Um, <clears throat> from about mid to 17, when I um, still regularly, like once, twice a month, was flying over to see Julian in the embassy, I realized that there was something changing with my treatment at the border. That's, of course, not CIA. That's purely UK border police uncles. And they like asked, started to ask funny questions like, do you live in the UK? What's your occupation? How long do you stay? What do you do in the UK? Before then, there was maybe one question, but not three, four of them. And the uh, most important was that I realized that he did not even listen to my answers. Sometimes he started the first question after I answered the third, and I was feeling like in a limbo, like with a machine who would randomly ask me things. But I then realized he was just waiting for the green light on the screen to, to let me go. And that green light probably meant um, that the team outside was ready to pick me up. And that's what happened. So um, I get into the UK and have people follow me like the whole fucking day, not only on the way to the embassy, from the embassy back and so on. Um, I once spotted one uh, of those persons, like sitting on a street level on the other side, watching the whole time I was in an office, ground level. <clears throat> and because I had a bit of experience with that in continental Europe, like in Germany, if you realize these guys go after you and you put your camera on your table, 
or start even to make photos of them, they're very quickly gone because they don't want to be, you know, relocated. They don't like to be exposed and so on. But the British behaved in this time, this scenario, completely different. So he was like getting like, you know, very aggressively body language, like spotting, looking back and so on. <clears throat> so um, that was a little weird. That same day at three o'clock in the night, when my friends drove me to the place where I was sleeping in a one-way street, there was still a car following us, um, even in the one-way street. So actually, um, he had to turn back and so on. That was no more covered surveillance. That was already the, the edge to intimidation. <clears throat> And then over the next months, I started to have new favorites, but not only in England, also in other countries, that I would see homeless looking like people on the street level, um, sitting there begging or leaning to some um, buildings. And at some point, I had to realize that the cheap plastic bags they were wearing were just a cover for cameras that were actually with Zoom and digital um, getting into my direction. So that felt a little, hmm. Um, and so the idea of this measurement, if you look at their manuals, which you'll find somehow in the internet, is uh, that the difference between discovered surveillance, which is to find out where you are and to open surveillance, which I call imitation, intimidation surveillance, the idea is you, you create in the person, in this case, in, yeah, for me, a state of distress. So you're like constantly having this like, you know, looking around and you obviously have the idea something is going on and they let you know, they want to let you know. And that's a little weird. <clears throat> So in April 2018, uh, excuse me, in March 2018, um, I brought one of my uh, crypto phones, in this case a desk phone based on a zip phone called SNOM 870, um, back to our workshop here to repair. The display had been exposed to heat and got a little melted. It's uh, not so super high quality LCD display. So I wanted just to display, the, to replace the display. So I opened the thing and I found actually a bug and that bug um, turned out to be a very sophisticated thing. So there was a battery pack, there was a shielded thing. Um, there was behind that shielded thing was a module that had been soldiered into. It was based on an FPGA, some hardware crypto elements, 16 gigabyte of flash ROM. It was completely passive, so I wouldn't have found it in any sweep because it just recorded whatever I talked on that encrypted phone um, and would be triggered by high frequency to send out the recorded stuff encrypted in a burst signal. Um, you see here in the URL to find more pictures online to give you an idea. This is the thing I found. Um, this is how it looked like at the beginning. It is the phone itself has two PCBs, one for the keyboard and one for the, you know, connectors, the processing, and so on. <laughs> this was the modified version of the keyboard PCB with this battery pack in blue, the shielded module. And here you get an idea of what was in there. Um, that's pretty high tech. We did, of course, look into what exactly do we have here, when were this um, chips produced, what does it do, and so on. Um, but um, it's pretty obviously that this is, like for those who have read the Snowden documents intensely, um, it's what's called special collection service. Inside there, there's a group called uh, targeted access or target access operations tau and they work together with a thing called pag the physical access group that because someone and that was the thing um it was not only built into this phone that phone had be of course it had been of course in a locked room and i had to ask myself okay what happened here here you see how they grabbed the audio with a glued mini pcb from the other main controller um, into their little technology. And here you see a comparison picture. To the right, you see the original PCB keyboard, which has almost nothing on it. And to the left, you see the modified version. 
A um, friend of mine made a bit of a diagram. Um, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it for you. You can review it later. I'll upload these PDF slides, of course. Um, so here's some aspects of what uh, was going through my head uh, over the time. Of course, the first question was, how long was this there? Um, no idea. Could be years. Um, the components we identified were produced around or no, no earlier than April 2013. So if you remember, Snowden came with this revelation mid of 2013, roughly. And I've been working for the Spiegel uh, with others on the Snowden documents next to that phone and coordinating a lot of it in the year 2013. Um, so in theory, it could be even related to that, who knows. Um, the dimensions suggest clearly a non-metric origin. The antenna would, you know, work in the range of um, 800 megahertz. So um, you find here um, mentioning of a PDF that tells you something about these groups. Um, but I did talk to some people who do professional sweeping, meaning looking for audio box and so on in devices and rooms. And they told me from the experience of the Cold War until today, the operation to bring something into a room, into a device, that's quite an effort because you need to secure, you need to ensure you don't get caught and so on. And so what you normally do is because technology can fail is you do not install one box, you install at least two. In the Cold War, people told me from the elder generation that the relationship was one to eight. So that because technology failed a lot back then. Um, however, that um, made me of course think, okay, what else could there be? You know, what can I do to find the rest and so on? Does it even make sense? Can I secure all the rooms that I use uh, to work here and there uh, in such a way that I could be sure? And of course, I can't be. So this was the first hard confrontation with my own cognitive dissonance because all that, you know, surveillance theater where I thought, okay, Julian has some trouble and I think I have something to do with it. And when I travel to England, okay, they follow me, you know, you get used to that kind of things. But like something you can have in your hand and that's outside of IT incidents, um, that means that all your encrypted communications have been listened to, well, that feels shitty. Um, so that's what I call a hard confrontation with my own cognitive dissonance. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is very recent. It's about one and a half months out, old now. When here in Berlin, um, I went out actually very early in the morning uh, to get some stuff from a grocery in a time of pandemic when no one is in the shop at seven something in the morning. I come back half an hour later and the key to my apartment uh, door does not fit in the cylinder anymore. Um, that felt a bit shitty. Um, it was not a normal cylinder. It was a so-called stealth cylinder. Um, you might want to look at the internet what it is. It's a Swiss company who's doing nice keys that you cannot photograph and copy because it has inner elements with a sophisticated mechanical a way of opening. <clears throat> I did, however, when I bumped into my door and had to, now first I called my locksmith dude, uh, or my friend from the lockpicking industry, I could say, um, who had advised me to buy that cylinder. Um, we, I talked with my lawyer and we agreed it's a good idea to call the police to put it on the other list of things that I had collected until then. Um, I then realized that I had been followed that morning, but I didn't take any attention to it because I was just walking, you know, in half automatic mode to the grocery. And there was a couple talking such a bullshit. Um, they will probably listen to this talk and will remember that dialogue. It was just not making any sense, but I was too polite to point it out. And they were very closely. So it was not about where I was going. It was about that I was not at home. So they ensured that in the time frame that I was there, the other guys could operate and so on. Um, yeah, that is an ongoing investigation, but I can tell you this is a, the next accident where like incident where like um, cognitive dissonance and the illusion you want to give yourself, you know, I'm not important in this game. Yeah, these guys follow me here and there and they 
this feels kind of different. This is no more nice. Um, here's a little bit of a, you get the idea of the cylinder. You cannot really see the object that was inserted, but um, at the end, we didn't get it out for forensic reasons. We had to drill, the police went through the apartment and so on. Um, yeah, another interesting day you can have. Um, <clears throat> so here's some aspects um, that I asked myself. Um, so was it even my cylinder? that I couldn't open. Maybe they could not um, lock pick the original stealth cylinder I had. They had to open it in a violent way. They were in the apartment to whatever, put another bug in there. Um, but as they couldn't replace it with the original cylinder, as they had destroyed it, like they put another one in and that's why my key wasn't fitting. It's an option. Next option was it maybe a trap to make me replace the broken cylinder with a cheaper one, with a more simple one that they could open then afterwards when I was gone. Next option. Um, or maybe was it not about the door at all? Was it maybe just to freak me out? Um, of course, it feels not so great if you can't open your own apartment door and so on. Um, and the fourth question was, of course, oh gosh, how much time did I spend that day with, you know, with the police, with drilling open the bore, with all that kind of things? It more or less cost me a day. Um, and what maybe happened to my to my machines, meaning my computers, my other things? Maybe where was my attention not in that time frame? Because it could be, it was a pure distraction thing. It would freak him out a little bit. And while he's freaking out, we do other things in his office or whatever. I can't rule it out. Um, and then, of course, I mean, the police sent me some funny questions. I'm still working on that. Like, yeah, should I name Pompeo as a suspect? Not sure, but um, maybe I should. Um, discussing it with my lawyer and so on. And also, is it maybe related to the date? This was the 3rd of November. Um, just in case to have it said, the 3rd of November is the election day or was the election day in the United States. And there was some accusation which one had something to do with the election um, some years ago. Um, so, however, the next event, <laughs> um, the incident number three, has to do with something that happened in between, because on Monday, the day before they messed up with my door, I had shipped some documents to Spain, I realized then. Um, that was legal documents that required me and a friend going to the Spanish embassy. We gave a tower of power of attorney and so on, because we are also accusing this company, UC Global, which I talked about last year, which was the company um, running the surveillance or the protection surveillance at the beginning on behalf of the Ecuadorians in that embassy. And later it turned out to be working for Shadow Ailson's company or at least um, having a site arrangement there, um, which is still subject to an ongoing lawsuit. And we participated in that lawsuit because not only Julian was spied on, everybody was spied on who was visiting him and so on. So I had shipped documents on that Monday, uh, almost six o'clock um, on the local post office here by DHL Express. I put that documents in a sealed bag. That's like a, a bag with a serial number and so on. That went together with a describing list was inside the bag into a white envelope that again, I sealed with, you know, seal tape. Um, then I gave that to the post office, but they insisted it gets in a DHL Express bag. That's what you get for the 70 euro um, to be arriving within two days. Um, so, um, yeah, the stuff arrived on Wednesday, but um, all opened. And um, the Spanish lawyers freaked completely out. They were very sure that this was a meddling. Um, you would see that it was sliced open and so on. Yes, you see this funny um, duct tape here called Sol. But um, why would the German customs open a document shipment within Europe? That just not makes a lot of sense. It's still uh, on the way to be checked. In theory, they could do that. But also this incident has some aspects. It's a breach of attorney-client privilege. That's why the Spanish lawyers insisted us we bring this to a criminal complaint. They did on their end right when they received it and they made these photos. 
Um, so was German uh, customs even involved or was just a duct tape used by some funny people? Um, why, when I emailed all this to my lawyer with the pictures and so on, why did he not receive the email until he realized on Monday that it somehow ended in his trash? Um, mm -hmm. He also freaked out. And um, then I talked with DHL, of course. I made a big fuss there. And they were like, no, we cannot tell you on which legal grounds the, the shipment was open. We cannot tell you who did it. But if you have an inquiry, why don't you send it to the customs? So without giving me even which customs entity it would be or whatever. And again, of course, this is kind of an interesting story, but I have normally other priorities in my life. So I'm asking myself, oh gosh, how many days shall I waste here with finding out who opened the fucking shipment? Um, but, you know, this is again the state of distress. This is again the, the effort. And it's again a reminder we are after you. We check your things. We don't like your um, suing the CIA suspected company and so on and so on. Um, so, coming to a bit of a conclusion of this talk, as we also want to have time for, for questions and so on, um, I want to talk about three aspects. The one is the elephant in the room and the problem of the missing sock. So, at some point, um, I don't want to say that I have been completely not in a state of distress, you know, so I don't know how this affects my sanity and those people surrounding me. So your cognitive systems get kind of otherwise triggered and you start to see these things everywhere. And when then um, you wash some socks and it turns out there's a sock missing, uh, the other person in my life was like, okay, CIA. Um, however, I did suspect the bad sheets and we found one of the socks in a bad sheet. So when you know the problem is socks get in the drum sometimes hanging, you wash something different than like a bad sheet and a bad sheet is an excellent place to hide things that have been in the drum and then get into the bad sheet and you just dry it with it and you don't even realize it and so on. So while I'm a complete... Um, I, I, for entertainment reasons, also for, you know, you need to relax your brain in such a situation once in a while. I'm totally okay to say the CIA is responsible for everything, including the missing socks. But suspect the bad sheet first and realize that, yes, this is a joke and this is escapism. And it helps you maybe to stay sane for the little moment. But in the long term, I don't know. So... And that's the, the, the I don't know part is the other two slides that are coming now. So what should I do? And you know, should I invite some friends and declare my office here um, like a laboratory for surveillance? Um, yeah, it has been before I looked at surveillance technology, but in this case, it's surveillance technology looking at me and my friends. So it's slightly different. Um, it's maybe also important to not get into some kind of auto-response mode when things happen. Because I was thinking, I said, what the fuck? Why are they doing all these things? It costs them money. It costs them effort. Um, is it to freak me out? Is it that they think that like, like, um, like I'm seriously in such an evil mode organization that, you know, they will escalate things and I will start to throw bombs at the U.S. Embassy or I don't know. Um, I have no idea what their idea is, but I would just try to stay like slow motion and think about it. Um, the next aspect is, however, um, do I infect other people? And now I'm not talking about my paranoia um, or my situational awareness, as I would call it, um, which, of course, at some point is ongoing and it's no more sometimes. Um, but... When I talk with normal people, with other journalists, with people I deal with for normal things, and they visit me and we do whatever kind of social uh, things, uh, like normal things like having food, and afterwards they, re re they call me a day later and say, oh, finally my phone started rebooting twice yesterday, and, and these kind of things. So that you think, okay, it's not my paranoia that um, is infectious, it's actually they obviously want to not only know what kind of people I'm dealing with and look into their technology, they also want to freak them out. So this is um, not cool. 
And it also means that the type of ignorance you could normally apply and say, well, ignorance is a bless. Um, come on, let's have, have a nice day um, and forget about all this. That's kind of limited. That's no more an option. Um, and also, while I've been dealing um, with that type of stress and that type of thing for a while now, and I can say, yeah, well, that's how it is. Um, and... Um, it doesn't mean that everybody dealing with you um, can do that. There's people who are seriously freaked out by such a situation and they, it creates fear, it creates anger, stress, and so on. So that's not cool. So um, my last slide, um, it ends up with a question to you guys is uh, how, how to get out of this mess. Um, so, you know, option one, I managed to get proper authorities to make the CIA stop acting illegal, okay. I heard the laughing. I know. This is ridiculous. Um, but, you know, it would be so beautiful. Justice prevails. Um, the German authorities, the European ones, pick it up. I finally managed to escalate it to the Generalbundesanwaltschaft. I do not have to talk with the German intelligence services, as I'm not sure they would be helpful in this game. Um, and they make the stop, the CIA stop acting illegal and against me and the other person surrounding. Beautiful dream, but okay, not very realistic, maybe. Option two, Pompeo realizes Jesus loves WikiLeaks and whatever shall become true will become true. He reads it on the Bible. Pompeo seems to be, if you look at his Twitter account, reasonable, believe in Jesus Christ and all that thing. So he realizes it's all wrongdoing against Julian and WikiLeaks and all the people targeted in that context and stops it. I know, okay, shit happens. Well, come good. Um, if that's realistic, I don't know, you tell me. Um, and the third option, uh, I don't know, maybe you have some ideas and that's my question to you, the audience. Um, and that's the end of my um, prepared part of the talk. And with these words, uh, thank you, Andy, for the brilliant talk. Um, in the meantime, I'm, I, I received some message. Uh, a third option would be to have a great vineyard. Vineyard, sorry. Um, I personally yes, yes, it's, it's completely right. I considered actually maybe I should do something with goats, become a farmer, or you know, yeah. There's there's these options, but I thought before I you know give it up and and find my way <laughs> on the countryside, um, I outsource the problem to the community and see what they think. In the meantime, I think there's uh, plenty of time for a great white wine. But uh, to our questions, uh, we have indeed qu plenty of questions. Um, the first question would be, um, how would you compare the surveillance of the CIA or other to the surveillance of the GDR? So for the uh, Deutsche Demokratische Republik. Um, well, I'm, I'm born in Hamburg in West Germany. I lived in East Germany uh, when the government was already falling into pieces. It was technically still there. So I'm not the best person to compare it. Um, but I did talk with a person I know who worked for the uh, foreign intelligence services because there was, you know, I simplified here, of course, the incidents a little bit. There was one scene when later I went into my kitchen that day when my door uh, lock got tampered with and I found a blue plastic glove and I don't have blue plastic gloves. And I asked my locksmith guy, he was like, no, it's not from me. And the police had black ones. So and I thought, hmm, what the fuck? Maybe the guys have been inside the apartment, which I didn't thought earlier because it was second lock and the police checked and so on. Um, and then I talked to, discussed it with this um, person I know, who's, who's a quite friendly man who was working in the foreign intelligence of that country and so on. He was like, you look, you have to look at it from a cost effectiveness point of view. Like that piece of plastic cost you 10 cent, nothing. And it freaks you out three months. So see how much, how cost-effective it is. And I mean, that's a good aspect. Um, that's a good point. Um, so I think that the East German Stasi, the, the guys, the East German intelligence guys, they also, they knew very well the difference and they had both instruments in their, you know, in their uh, program to either do covert surveillance to really like, 
not let you know and the department for we let him know and see how he reacts or we let him know because he's ongoing doing things and we want him to you know stop it and and get intimidated and so on and get scared maybe or his wife gets scared or these kind of things so i think it is comparable cool uh oh well not cool um speaking of uh covered versus uh over civilians civilians sorry um as you now know does it still bother you emotionally um well what bothers me sometimes is you know it's also it, it has a sometimes it's nice to be alone and it's sometimes nice to not think about the CIA guys um, being in the apartment next door, or in my case, in an apartment under me, uh, or in, in the surrounding environments, um, but thinking about normal things like playing a puzzle or seeing some funny spy movies. Oh, wait, that's <laughs> almost <laughs> relaxing. No, seriously. Um, at some point, it sucks a little bit. I I can kind of deal with it, um, but I mean, this 2020 year has, of course, complicated um, or has made it almost impossible to travel. So normally, I escape my intensity of my work situation with travels. Maybe um, I can do that this year. So I I feel a little more intense, and it, it it annoys a little bit. And I would like to get these guys out of my life and do something useful with their life or whatever. Yeah. Um, the next question, um, he or she or uh, the person or uh, creature um, probably missed it. Uh, do you disassemble all your devices on a regular basis? No, I usually do just irregular and seal them. Um, in this case, um, the seal had had an issue with the with the heat as well. So, I, and I was lousy on checking it. I have to say. Um, okay. So yes, that's something. I mean, if you have one office, you can do that. I tend to work on different continents, even, and that um, turned out to be a bit of an issue. So yes, you need to have safes everywhere and seals and da 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 da, da. But even then, you know, um, Pompeo seems to have justified um, or have given orders to do these things no matter the costs. And my expectation to have like a private or a secure encrypted channel so is very limited for a while watching that effort. The encryption of the cryptophone obviously was good, otherwise they wouldn't have had the effort to, you know, build something in. But um, at the end of the day, um, for me, um, it has the same impact. It's like, well, yeah, it's a phone. It's a piece of device. It's in a room. The room has windows. We've seen what they've done with the embassy windows and so on. So it's like, yeah, security, what a nice idea, but it doesn't really exist. Yeah. Um, do you try giving a few coins to the homeless looking people to do either some uh, reverse intimidation or good deed if they are not CIA? <laughs> yeah, that's a, I mean, I had this one particular situation where I was waiting for someone on a kind of a shopping street and I just I just thought something is wrong with the guy but when I saw the camera and saw him, he also rushed away so no I didn't give them the money <laughs> the second scenario um, no but it's a good idea um, the thing is that what I started to do is to always have a camera with me that turns out for me to be important to be able to document things and also most of them except the british don't like it when they are being photographed and you uh, either they it's very interesting because normal people do realize when they are being photographed but these guys are either pretending no i don't see that you photograph me you know they look but a little bit with too much energy away at that <laughs> moment um, or they are seriously disturbed and go away so the best uh, solution would be to have the boldest, biggest, largest camera uh, always for hand. Yeah, let me say it like this. I mean, I've 
not been a fan of surveillance technology and for sure not of CCTV for a long part of my life, but I start to like the idea of CCTV at some places in my own environment. I'm sorry to say that. Um, but there's compromises you can make, like so while feet, you know, other parts, you don't always need the faces. And if you need the faces, yeah, there's options. And still, analog photography is a great thing. Um, but that's my personal opinion. Um, you maybe you want to, you can talk, maybe you cannot talk about. Um, do you use other counter measurements um, you want to talk about or you can talk about? No, I obviously don't want to talk about it. But I mean, I've been, um, I was wondering um, myself how, um, why I had this rather intense things going on in me. I was wondering, is it the time frame? Is it me as a person? It might have to do with actually being in this uh, funny scene. Of course, I've I've learned. I mean, I know lock picking persons. I've always um, had an eye on having good locks based on their advice and understanding how easy it would be otherwise. And using encryption was also not always about let like um, hiding something. It was just good practice of having privacy and operational security. So for me, that was very normal for many years to do that. And maybe, you know, compared to other persons that made me more interesting. I don't know. Um, I'll find out one day. Um, but I think it's a good idea for everybody involved to think about these three aspects, physical security, encryption, and also uh, what kind of ways do you have to realize if something is being tampered with? Yeah. And that's not okay. necessarily monitoring. I mean, monitoring can help, but on the other hand side, yeah, with monitoring systems, they can also deal with. Like physical checksums, kind of. <laughs> um, our next question, uh, do you ask the police at the border if everything is prepared now? <laughs> Uh, you mean at the British border? Uh, probably that's the reference to. I don't travel to the UK anymore. I decided, you know, after they dealt with Julian there, I don't like that place anymore. I never felt so well there. And actually, maybe I forgot to mention that um, after this kind of um, treatment at the border started, I also uh, started avoiding sleeping in the UK. So I made day trips. Uh, sometimes in order to get uh, the last plane out of the country, I was flying to Zurich first because it was a late flight thing to Zurich and then next morning to Berlin. I felt in Zurich better at a bar of a shitty hotel than in London central city with... Um, yeah, the special relationship, as it's called, between the intelligence of the UK and those of the US. I see. Um, speaking of sleeping, or in this case, concerning your apartment, um, that question would be, uh, would some home surveillance system bring some relief? For example, well, that's like that's like exchanging devil with the other dude, right? I, yeah. I mean. Um, no, I'm not really a friend of that, but yes, of course, I had to, at the end of the day, at least check with my door and so on, what I can do to detect and record things and so on. But it's not a pleasure. It's not like, uh, I don't know. I mean, yes, you, you end up doing that kind of shit, but that's not how life on planet Earth should be. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a trade-off. Um for what return and I yeah i mean the, the thing is i mean look i'm a german citizen what i'm doing is constitutionally protected i live in the governmental district of berlin it's fairly safe here but you know i have friends in other places other situation in life is completely different there and um that is more what worries me, that I'm in a relatively cool position, secure position. That's why I can talk about these things. But I have friends who have a more severe situation and they are not sure they should talk about it to not escalate things. And that's a very tricky uh, choice to make, maybe. Yes, indeed. Um, that brings us to another question, and I think this is a perfect point to mention that uh, can we do uh, what can we do to support you in getting out of this mess and what 
can we do in general for this? Well, I really appreciate the question. I don't have a good answer, but I think, um, yes, I would like to discuss more with people about what can be done. Um, I mean, I'm for the moment, I'm dealing with police, with lawyers, the, the, the Spiegel guys I'm working with, they also um, find some ways maybe to address it. Um, but it seems like at least if it comes to Julian's situation, things are uh, yeah badly escalated and it's all a bit interrelated. So I don't have a good answer at this moment, but I think it's a good idea to discuss it more. And um, uh, so maybe identifying other people who are in some kind of a risk situation because these things happen. And as I maybe hopefully was able to show, it's not that difficult to get into such a mess it's, it happens yeah and uh, speaking of discussing you mentioned earlier there is a big blue button uh, to discuss any further you will find it in the 2d area in a 2d world in the whistleblower wiki is that right uh, yes in the tent actually i was oh, told sorry. and the tent is the url to the big blue button or somehow it's interlinked there so again, um, please go out, uh, explore the 2D world and, of course, the whistleblower tent. Um, we still have some minutes left. Um, how do you do mentally? Um, did you use any methods to keep your head clean or clear and uh, not freak out? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I drink too much vodka, but I, <laughs> I try to keep it with good quality. Um, let me say it like this. Um, the real trouble is maybe that while in this scene here, people have a rough understanding of this type of things already. Um, I also liked uh, to have or to, to be around with people who have nothing to do with you know, IT, with security, with all these kind of things. So-called normal people, sometimes it's refreshing to be with them. But um, their ability to understand this mess is a little bit limited. <laughs> so um, it's... I think others judge better how I'm doing mentally. I'm trying to keep my head up and um, finding a good way out. But if anyone has a good idea, I'm really um, all for listening and um, see what's possible. In this case, I can, can come back to uh, the vineyard. Uh, it's pretty relaxing uh, to have work in the uh, late autumn. All Outside. right. Even during a pandemic, okay, you just yeah, have well, to find the way there. Yeah, it's uh, outside and it's uh, a lot of distance between the people. I think this will work. Um, so the last question: um, red or white wine? Uh, oh, red, uh, red wine. Red. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> And um, I mean, thank, thanks for all this. Um, just to point out, please, we also have to work on to get in Julian out there and others who are in this mess who can't even talk about it. Um, I really appreciate um, the option here to talk to you guys, but it's also about the others. And um, yeah, let us get Julian out here, please, out that shit there. <laughs> With this great word, um, Andy, thanks for your time. Uh, thanks for being here at the Remote Chaos. Um, as mentioned, we still have the opportunity to ask you some questions in the whistleblower tent. And uh, with this, have a nice evening. Uh, try to relax and see you latest next time. Goodbye.